because all of you speak a lot better. master's degree program is one that is if you want to go into journalism if you want to go into uh, reporting or some sort this is where you want to go to school and they are uh, very elite in that they only accept a certain number of students and they have to be of the highest caliber and credentials but they also are very strict on their students in fact they have uh, what they call the medial f i'm glad they didn't have a bear valley f thing and you'll be uh, appreciative of this. The Medeal F is if you turn in any paper in which you have one word misspelled, you fail that entire course. And that's pretty strict, isn't it? Uh, but the point that they're trying to get across is that you know you need to, as a reporter, as a journalist, you need to make sure that, that you have thoroughly gone through your story, that all your facts and figures are correct, that everything is just so-so and exactly right. I wonder how many instructors through the years have spent hour after hour meticulously going through each and every uh, word in a paper and assignment trying to find that one misspelled word. That's what makes so interesting what happened just a couple of years ago when they had their graduation exercises at Northwestern. They gave out 33 of the 400 diplomas had a misspelled word on it. In case you can't find it up there, it's highlighted. The School of Journalism Media Integrated is spelled integrated. I don't know what they did to those instructors that was responsible for those degrees. I don't know if they fired them on the spot or what. But isn't that often the case, though, that, that when we are the ones that spend so much time looking for the faults and the problems of others, we're the ones making the mistakes and the problems, right? Because we all make mistakes. We all do those things that are going to wind us up having errors. Doing things that are wrong. We all make mistakes. And we love to hear about other people's mistakes, don't we? I found an article that had, had several, uh, they called it the biggest mistakes in modern history. I don't know how they quantified that, but just a few of them that's on the list. Uh, for example, there were 13 publishing houses that rejected uh, Harry, the Harry Potter manuscript before one finally did accept it. You know, you know those other 13 are saying, we got made a lot of money with that, of course. Uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brand approached Excite C owner George Bell and offered to sell him Google back in 1999 for $1 million. He thought it was overpriced. It's now worth about $365 billion. Don't you know he looks back at that mistake? And we laugh at those kinds of mistakes. Facebook turned down programmer uh, Act, uh, Brian Acton and Jan Cohn in a job interview. And then about three years later, they paid $19 billion for the, the uh, app that the company had, uh, had developed after the rejection. What's that? Don't you know they rejected or realized what it was? mistake that rejection was. The French foreign government uh, recently uh, spent about $15 billion on a new fleet of trains. And only after they had spent the money and, and received the trains did they realize that they were too wide for 1,300 platforms across the country. It cost about $26 million to fix that problem. And, and the funniest one on the list, this is not the entire list, but Back in 1962, Deco was wanting to, to sign a British band. And so they narrowed it down to two bands. They finally chose one that they signed, Brian Poole and the Tremolines. Have you ever heard of Brian Poole and the Tremolines? 
No one has. By the way, the group they turned down was a four-piece band out of Liverpool named the Beatles. We like laughing at people's mistakes, don't we? Because there are so many that we make, and we particularly appreciate when other people make mistakes, right? In fact, we make mistakes so many times that we have little sayings that we've developed about our mistakes and about other people's mistakes, two of which actually have some of their roots in what we're going to study about from God's Word today. Uh, the first of those is, is the saying, nobody's perfect. Have you heard that before? Well, nobody's perfect. Don't worry about it. Or you made that mistake, well, I know, but nobody's perfect. We, we'll try to use that to excuse ourselves from the mistakes that we've made. Well, nobody's perfect. What we don't realize is that by admitting that we're not perfect and that nobody is perfect, we're admitting that there is a perfect. We know that, of course, is God. The other saying that, that we've come up with that we'll use a lot that, that really has its basis in our lesson uh, for today. By the way, did you pitch... Nobody's briefing. That's what I had on the last slide. Nobody's briefing. So either I messed up typing or you messed up catching it. But either way, we made a mistake on that one, didn't we? Nobody's perfect. The other one that we'll make, it, that we'll say sometimes, is that whoever is uh, perfect or whoever's without sin can cast the first stone. Right? Have you heard that before? Well, if you're so perfect, then you can cast the first stone. Well, if they think that they're no, uh, without mistake, then they can cast the first stone. But all of that really has its genesis in what we're going to be studying today from John uh, chapter 8. And John chapter 8 is a, a very interesting account, and it's one that we need to consider very carefully this morning because the title of our lesson this morning is, uh, I may just have to point at you back there in the back and the third point. Are we throwing stones or are we lifting burdens? Are we throwing stones? Or are we lifting burdens? We really need to ask ourselves that question. And think about as we're reaching out into our community, as we're dealing with brothers and sisters in Christ, and as we handle the relationships with inside our homes and our families, are we throwing stones or are we lifting burdens? Maybe a, a better way to put that that's a little bit more uh, succinct and make a little bit more sticky for you a little bit to, to, to attach in, inside your brain is, is this idea that we should compel don't condemn compel don't condemn if you don't remember anything else from today's lesson I hope you'll remember those three words compel don't condemn if we're for trying to figure out how that we can get people to be followers of Jesus if we're trying to figure out how that we can get babes in Christ young Christians to continue to serve Him. We're trying to figure out how that we can keep our, our elders serving as shepherds. How that we can encourage those that, that are, are serving as deacons. How that we can encourage our ministers. Compel. Don't condemn. Particularly when we think about how that we deal with those that are outside of the body of Christ. So what I want us to do this morning is I want us to look into John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to go through this particular text, and we're going to talk about that idea of compel, don't condemn. And we're going to look at the, the text itself and give an explanation of the text. We're going to text. We're going to illustrate the, that main point that's within it, and then we're going to give some application at the end of the lesson to kind of help us to uh, maybe apply it to our own lives so that we can be better as we serve our Lord and try to be others too. First of all, the explanation of the text. If you look in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, I've got the, the New American Standard Translation uh, on the board. If you uh, don't have a Bible with you or if you're uh, having trouble finding it, we'll, we'll go through and kind of look at, at what's going on in the text first. It says everyone went to his home. That's the last of chapter 7, uh, the very last line from chapter 7. It kind of helps you. In, in context, what's going on is Jesus is going to the temple here toward the end of his life, and he's teaching. And as he's teaching every day, the people are coming to hear what he has to teach. In the evening, Jesus, when people would go to their homes, he would go to the Mount of Olives. That's what you see in verse 1, that Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. 
And there, while he's at the Mount of Olives, he, at night times, one of the places that he loved to go to uh, during the, especially the latter part of his ministry time, that, that he could spend there with his disciples, that he could spend in prayer, that he could spend relaxing. And he would go there and then back to the temple early in the morning. And it's important to know that the setting of what takes place here in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, takes place early in the morning. Because early in the morning at the temple was a time of great activity. The temple was the center of Jerusalem, and it was the center of the entire nation. It was the center of, of all activity that went on. And so you would have had people sitting up their stands to sell those things that were necessary for worship. Uh, those, uh, the, 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 the commerce side of things that was going on, you would have had the, the priests and the Levites who had been showing up at the temple and beginning with the day's preparation for worship. Uh, they would have been uh, starting to bring in livestock and those things that were to be sacrificed uh, on the altar that day, and those things would be uh, start to be slaughtered. People were coming there to worship the Lord. They were coming there in order that they might to make the sacrifices the hustle and bustle that would have gone on at that place. And it says that when he came there early in the morning, all the people were coming to him. Sometimes we'll watch Bible-based television shows or movies, and you'll see Jesus moving around, especially at the end of his days. It'll be him and the 12 and, you know, 15 or 20 people. Don't think that way. Because there were crowds following Jesus, large crowds. Here in the center of all the activity, there's all of these people that are coming to Jesus so that he might teach them. And so he would sit down and begin to teach them. And they would listen to him. That was the, the posture that they would take in those days. The teacher would sit down and everybody else would stand up and listen to him. I kind of like that idea, by the way. But I won't ask you to do that because you probably won't stay here until the very end of the sermon if I did. Maybe. But that's what's going on here early in this morning that all this is beginning to happen. Now the majority of those people came to Jesus because they wanted to hear him teach but we find out beginning in verse 3 that there's some individuals that are coming not for that purpose. In verses 3 and 4, it says the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And they set her down in the center of the court. They called her in adultery. The scribes and Pharisees had tried many times on many occasions to trick Jesus. And later on in this passage, we're going to find out that that's their intention with this particular occasion. They're coming there to test Jesus so they might accuse Him is what the text says. But they, they've they caught her in the act. All the other times they've tried, it's been kind of hypothetical situations. Suppose a man marries a woman and she dies and then she marries his brother. It's hypothetical. Yeah. What do you say is the greatest commandment? It's hypothetical. But who is my neighbor? See, we're, we're dealing with abstract ideas. But now, you know the scribes and Pharisees are thinking, we've got it. Because she's been caught in adultery. And they bring her to the center of the court where Jesus was at. Depending on which scholar you read, and their opinion means no more than yours does. But some think maybe this is the, the court of the Gentiles, which was the exterior court. Maybe it was the, the court of the women, which was inside of that. But either way... They were right there at the temple in, in close proximity. If you'll excuse the phrase, they were within a stone's throw of the temple. And that's important because of what's about to be said in the next few verses. So they bring him to him and they said, Teacher, now they don't really want to be taught, but they're trying to feign at least some respect for him. They say, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery <coughs> in the very act. Again, emphasizing the fact that there's no doubt of her guilt. This isn't a hypothetical situation. We're not talking about abstract ideas. We're talking about a woman that has been caught in adultery. What makes us think about, you know, usually, typically, could have been, but typically, first thing is the, in the morning is not when this particular sin takes place, is it? So is it that, that they've maybe set her up to be caught? Is it that they've called her sometime before, but they, they kept her so that they could bring her to Jesus. Because again, their purpose is to test Him so that they might accuse Him. And so the next thing they say, they continue, they say, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What the 
did to you say? What they're doing is they're trying to pit Jesus against Moses. Because in their eyes, Moses was the lawgiver. He is the authority for what's going on. And in their mind, they're saying, well, if Jesus was to be one that goes along with what Moses says, then we can say, well, what about all this grace and mercy and forgiveness that you've been talking about? And we can trick him in that way. And if he says that she should not be put to death, then we can say, hey, Moses is the authority, and you're going to remember, we caught her in the very act. And in the law, Moses said, and if you doubt that, Jesus, go over that wall in that building over there that, that you can see, the other side of that wall there. And in the back room of that building, in that little trunk, you can find the copy of the, the law that Moses wrote. So if, if you have any questions about what we're telling you that Moses said, if you think maybe we're misrepresenting what, what Moses said, it's right over there. So what do you say, Jesus? Now, if we go back into the Old Testament, we find out that what they're saying is somewhat true, at least. Because it says in uh, Leviticus chapter 20, if a, there is a man, that's interesting, isn't it? That particular sin is one that it generally takes a man and a woman, right? That's not a sin that she commits on her own. But where's the man? Notice he says, this is Moses writing, if there is a, a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one, that's a man, who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer, that's masculine, and the adulteress, that's feminine, both of them shall surely be put to death. But where's the man? You flip over to Deuteronomy in, in the second telling of the law that, that Moses gives us in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 22, he says it this way, if there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits uh, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be put to death. And he goes on there in, in, in Deuteronomy to talk about how the, that the reason this is to be done is so that, that the, the uh, uh, impurity, the sin of Israel might be taken away. So, in the first reading and the second reading, it's the man and the woman. They didn't bring the man because their purpose is not to cleanse the sin from Israel. Their purpose is to test Jesus so that they might accuse Him. And He recognizes that. So if you keep on reading here in John, in verse 5, it says, Now in the law Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say? You've seen what Moses said. What do you say is the right thing for us to do in regard to this point? They were saying this, as I mentioned before, verse 6 tells us here, why they were asking him this question. Because they were testing him so that they might accuse him. Jesus is too smart to be called in their trial. So notice what Jesus does. It says that he stooped down and with his finger he wrote on the ground. He doesn't get caught up in the debate. Sometimes we do that, don't we? Uh, on social media or uh, in maybe face to face. More often, though, it's online nowadays. It's amazing the things we will tell people electronically that we would never say to their very face, isn't it? We don't have to show up for every argument that we're invited to, do we? Jesus did. He stooped down and he rode on the ground. And he basically ignores what they're saying. But if you notice, they're not willing to let him get out of it. They want an answer because they're wanting to test him. They're wanting to accuse him. So they were, they were uh, accusing him. They were testing him with this question. And then they, in verse, uh, verse 6 here, it says that when he's riding on the ground, maybe I'm making too much out of this, but if you think about the last time that that we see kind of that idea of riding on the ground, or riding with your finger, rather. Back in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter 31, it says when he, that's God, had finished speaking with him, that's Moses upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with his finger. And maybe, maybe there's no connection there. But 
the only time that we have in Scripture that that deity is riding with his finger these two times. And it's interesting that in the, the, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, it's the same words for Exodus 31, 18 as we find in John chapter 8, riding with his own finger. See, while they're trying to test Jesus by pinning him against Moses, because in their mind, Moses is the lawgiver, but Jesus is really the lawgiver, right? Moses isn't the one that wrote the law. We call it the law of Moses. Moses is not the one that wrote the law of Moses. He's just the penman. Originally, it was written by the Lord. In fact, Moses' copy wasn't even the original copy. He wrote the original copy, remember? And had to rewrite it. They're trying to basically pit the Lord against himself, but they don't realize that particular idea. In verses 7 and 8, they, they persisted in asking, come on, Jesus, what's the answer? Come on, big boy, you've got the answer for everything. What, you seem to be the master teacher. Everybody's marveled at how you speak with authority. Come on, what's the answer to this? We're not talking about hypothetical. She's been caught in adultery. So what can you possibly say when you've got her before you and the law of Moses over there in that little building? What's the answer, Jesus? When they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at him. And he stooped down and he rolled him around. Those of you that are, are bringing this woman before me, by the way, without the man, by the way, first thing in the morning, probably not when it happened. By the way, not because you're trying to purge Israel of sin, but because you're trying to make me look bad, you're trying to test me and accuse me, you that are trying to make yourself look good, and you that have the worst intentions that anyone could possibly have, if you're without sin, then you can cast the first stone. Now, some take this passage and run too far with it. Let's be sure not to do that. He's not saying that, as some will say, well, that means you can't judge me. Because if you back up into John chapter 7 and verse 24, he commands the people, this is a, an imperative, do not judge me with unrighteous judgment, but here's a second command. He commands us, but judge me with righteous judgment. In John chapter 7, I mean, Matthew chapter 7, where we'll typically go, you know, judge not, that's the, maybe the most quoted verse these days. But in that same context, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying not to cast our pearls before swine. That requires a judgment, doesn't it? The idea is, are you using righteous judgment or unrighteous judgment? Are you judging according to what the Word says? Are you judging according to your standards? And now, here you have the Lamb of God saying that to them. In the background, they're probably hearing sheep being slaughtered for sin. Now what it is that Jesus wrote on the ground when he stood back down is one of those kind of things that scholars and I point myself like I'm, I'm not a scholar, but scholars and and uh, and you know ministers and religious uh, leaders will you know have long been a great debate. What was it that Jesus wrote on the ground? Well, the truth is the scripture doesn't tell us. We have been doing some research, and I think probably this is a good representation. Uh, we've translated it into the English of what he, uh, he wrote on the ground. That's really not what he wrote, probably. <laughs> My son wrote that in the infield of the baseball field right around the corner of our house, actually. <laughs> what he wrote, we don't know, and, and there's lots of speculation, and again, their opinion is no better than mine or what Gary wrote in the infield ground. What matters is not what he wrote, but what he said. Because if you look at the very next verse, what it says is that when they heard this, I get to the next verse, when they heard it, what did they hear? They heard the one that is without sin can cast the first stone out. When they heard that, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the oldest, down to the youngest. Now why is it the older to the younger? The scripture didn't tell us, but you got to think about the older you get, don't you realize the more mistakes you've made? And when I was younger, I thought I could make no mistakes. You remember those days? But the older I get, the more I realize 
how much of a failure at a husband that I've been. The older I get, the more I realize how many times I've failed as a daddy. How many times I've failed as a ministry. How many times I've failed as a son of God. And how much mercy and grace and forgiveness I've needed. And how many times have those men, especially the older ones, walked up that hill, walked up those steps to carry a sacrifice for their sins. And as the Lamb of God is speaking to them, they're hearing those sheep in the background being slaughtered for sins that very morning. And they turn and walk away. Left her alone with the woman, or left him alone rather with the woman, where she was in the center of the court. So finally, straightening up, Jesus looks around and he says to her, Women, or woman, where are those who condemn you? That word that he uses there, is there no one that condemns you? Where are those who condemn you? That word means it's a judicial word. It means you are, are guilty of a crime that you must pay the price for your punishment. Where are those who would condemn you? She says, no one more. So Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Now Jesus is not excusing her sin because He loves her too much to leave her in her sin. Notice the end of that verse. He says, from now on, sin no more. She's recognized that He's the Lord. He's telling her, you need to repent and live a faithful life for the Lord. <clears throat> but I'm not going to require you to pay the penalty for your sins. Because Jesus is about to, in a few chapters over, pay the penalty for her sins Himself. And by the way, the penalty of your sins and my sins. Now, which of those two groups do you think would be most likely to be influenced to follow, have that woman follow the Lord? The ones who were ready to condemn her? How many times did she walk up those steps for a sacrifice because of her sins? And this time she probably walked up those steps thinking she was about to be sacrificed for her sins. Or the one that has shown to her compassion. See, that's the one she's going to want to follow. It's the one that has shown compassion. In fact, if you think about it, that's the way Jesus always dealt with those that the religious elite would marginalize and push to the side. He would compel them by showing compassion rather than condemn them. In fact, the one group that you see most often Jesus condemning are the religious elites who think more highly of themselves than they ought to. Those people who think that they've done no wrong. Those people who are always running down others and making themselves self-righteous. Time after time we see Jesus dealing the same exact way with others. And you can illustrate that by looking at just a few of the times that Jesus dealt with those. You remember the woman at the well? The one that, that none of the religious leaders would have dared talk to because she was a Samaritan, because she was a woman, because she was someone living in sin, they would never have talked to her. In fact, it surprised her so much that she asked Jesus, why are you talking to me because I'm a Samaritan woman and you're a Jewish man? Now, Jesus didn't overlook her sins. He pointed out, here's what you're doing that's wrong, but He talked to her. He cared enough about her to give her the message that if you would take of the water that I offer, you will never have to thirst. You'll never have to come to this well again. See, he saw her not as just a sinful woman outside of the borders of, of our religious group. He saw her as a person. He saw her as a soul. Remember Matthew, Levi, as he's called in the text, the tax collector? The Jews hated the tax collectors. You remember how many times you can see in the, in the Gospels that the, there were the sinners and the tax collectors. You know why they separated them? They didn't want to offend the sinner by lumping him in the same group with the tax collector. That's how little they thought of that. These were the Jews that were working for the enemy. See? And we don't want anything to do with them. And Jesus walks up on 
to, let, uh, to Levi, Matthew, and says, follow me. And Matthew followed and wrote the gospel. Because Jesus saw him not as a sinner. He saw him not as just a tax collector. He saw him not as just a traitor. He saw him as a man. He saw him as a soul. Remember the woman who came to Jesus when he was eating a meal with the religious elite? And she began to, to weep tears at his feet and wash his feet with her tears and her hair. And the religious leaders that were there, they, they thought among themselves that, you know, if Jesus was any kind of prophet, he would know what kind of woman it was that was talking to him, and he wouldn't have anything to do with her. That was their philosophy. But Jesus said, you don't send a doctor to someone who's well, you send a doctor to someone who's sick. I came to seek and save the lost, and he saw her not as just a sinful woman, but I see her as a soul that needs to be saved. Think about Zacchaeus. He's another one of those tax collectors, but he was also, as, as we sing, and now I'll put this song you haven't stuck in your head the rest of the day, a wee little man and a wee little man was he. And he saw Jesus, and he, he wanted to be able to see him as he came down, so he climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, and as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down from there, for I'm going to your house today. Now, we don't put it in the song, but we ought to have half the group go, Whoa! Because that's what all the religious leaders would have done. How could he possibly go eat with this man? It was because he didn't just see him as a sinner. He didn't just see him as a tax collector. He saw him as a man. He saw him as a soul. And before the end of that day, Zacchaeus was wanting to, to make retribution for all the things he had done wrong. Because Jesus had compelled him by showing him compassion. Rather than just condemning him. Jesus does the same thing even for us today, doesn't He? Not just those who are, but to everyone. He offers His invitation. Come unto me, all ye that are weary and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart. You shall have rest to yourself. See, He sees you, and He sees me as a soul. Hell, don't be me. And you think about how we apply this today for us. And it's pretty easy because probably in this room there are a lot of people that fit into the category of those scribes and Pharisees. And I'd say if we're all honest, we could say that every single one of us at one point or another have done that. We've looked at someone else and the mistakes that they've made and, and isn't it interesting how someone else's sins and wrongs are always worse than mine. Kind of like you know, surgery. Dean's having minor surgery. You know why it's minor surgery? Because it's on him and not Corey. He's not going to have surgery. Someone else's minor surgery. Never mind her when it's happening. Sin is that way. What Dean struggles with, I look and say, how in the world could he have a problem with that? He probably looks at me and says the same. How many times are we willing to to, to push someone to the side. How many times we don't bring them into the court square and, and stone them today. Instead we give them a Facebook stoning today. We give them a Twitter stoning. And we run them down and we write them up in the publications and we say, woe is me. Look at how bad they are. And aren't we glad we're not that bad? But how many times do we take the time to go to that person and say, brother, I love you. Let me help you with that. Maybe we're like the woman in the story. And here's the problem with condemning other people is that if, if you are struggling with something, and you probably are, we all tend to, most of the time we don't really have to tell people what they're doing is wrong, do we? I know the things that I struggle with are wrong. And it doesn't matter how much you condemn me, you know who condemns me worse than anyone else? Do we push people away and tell them, at least in our minds, that there's no way that person would obey the gospel? Aren't we glad we're not like him? It never do any good to share the, the message of Jesus with them because they're not going to do anything about it. Wayne Berger always says that we become soul testers instead of seed sowers in those cases. Do we think of ourselves in that situation? That there's no way that God can forgive me. There's no way that Jesus can wash me. There's 
no way he could possibly want it. The truth is, he does. That invitation that he offered that woman, that he offered the Samaritan woman, that he offered Zacchaeus, he's offering us today. That I love you. And I want you to be one of mine. He came to seek and to save the lost. There's going to be a day in which Jesus will be the judge, Philippians 2 tells us. And in that day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. We don't want to take him that way. We want to take him as he presents himself to us now. One that loves you. One that has already paid the price for your sins. So he tells us just to come to me and let me wash away those sins. You know, the, the, the next screen that's going to pop up here is one that's kind of nasty. When I show that in Colorado, they think it's snow falling, but if you're in the south, you've seen that on your windshield, haven't you? But we were driving across uh, Missouri here a few weeks ago, and, and it was at night time again, and said, what is that that keeps hitting the windshield, Daddy? And it's been so long since we lived in the South, he forgot what it's like to have bugs all over the windshield. Stories told about a man who uh, was traveling down the interstate, and his windshield got to be in about this shape, and he pulled over to a gas station, and a tenant came out and said, can I help you? And he said, yeah, can you wash my windshield? So the man, sp the tenant sprayed it down, and he he washed it really well, and, and the driver's standing there with his arms crossed, and he said, that's pitiful. You didn't get half of the spots off. Do it again. So the tenant sprays it down, and he scrubs the windshield really well, and, and the, the driver says, you still didn't get them off. Do it again. So the man, sp the tenant sprays the windshield, and he scrubs as hard as he can, and the driver finally says, well, that's it. If you can't do better than that, I don't have time to waste on you anymore. He gets in his car, and he slams the door shut, huffing and puffing. His wife reaches up and takes off his glasses. She wipes them off and she puts them back on his face. And the spots were gone. <laughs> but isn't that what we do sometimes? We look at each other and we say, you need to clean your windshield and the problem is how I'm looking at you. Because I'm looking at you ready to condemn you rather than looking at you ready to show you compassion. Rather than wanting to compel you to serve the Lord. Are we throwing stones? Or are we lifting burdens? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't preach against sin because we ought to. But we need to do it, speak that truth in love. We need to show people that God loves them and that Jesus loves them. And we want you to know this morning if you're visiting with us, if you're someone who who's attends here regularly, that's maybe you put on Christ in baptism, maybe you have not, but there's something you're struggling with and you're thinking no one can understand. Does. For all the great things that I've heard that Dean's talked about this congregation, I'm going to bet that the only pain you have to worry about this morning if you accept the Christ invitation is maybe your neck hurting after getting in hugs so many times before the day's done. So we're going to sing this song to encourage you, to compel you, to think about do you really know who Jesus is? Do you really get how much He loves you? Do you understand what He did for you? Because if you do, you're going to be compelled to follow Him. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. But He can only do that if you're in Him. This group doesn't want to condemn you. They want to compel you to follow the Lord and serve Him. So if we can help you this morning, if we can study with you, if we can encourage you, if we can uh, help you to put on Christ in baptism, that there's going to be a, one of the elders and Dean are going to be down here in the front. They would love to help you with that. If you're someone who's part of the body of Christ that wandered away and needs to come back to them, they'd love to pray with you and for you. Are we throwing stones or lifting burdens? Jesus stands ready. This group stands ready to come right now.